the webinar of Conversations on COVID-19 series. I am Hal Ali, the coordinator of Easter Alliance for Global Health Partnerships. Today's webinar is the ninth in the series, and these webinars take place every Friday at 12 p.m. GMT. And every week we host experts from different academic and professional backgrounds in the global health and healthcare to discuss various aspects of COVID-19 pandemic. It's our pleasure today to co-organize this webinar with the African European Parliamentarians Initiative. The African European Parliamentarians Initiative is a non-profit organization which promotes good governance, human rights, and democracy in Africa. The topic today is balancing human rights and competing priorities in the global COVID-19 response. A recording of this webinar will be available in our websites, YouTube channels shown in the screen, and Irish Global Health Network and Easter Alliance. Live streaming is also available right now on our YouTube channel, Irish Global Health Network. If you have any questions during the webinar, you can use the question and answer feature in the bottom of the screen. For now, I will leave you with my co-host Nadine Ferris france the Executive Director of Irish Global Health Network, to introduce, to, to introduce the speakers and uh, lead the panel discussion. Thank you, Hella, and uh, welcome everybody. Delighted to see so many people and welcome to our amazing panelists. Um, I'm just going to introduce our panelists and maybe first just to say that, um, as you know, Dr. Akram Ali Eltom, the Federal Minister of Health for the Government of Sudan, was meant to be joining us here today. And unfortunately, we were in touch with him all the way along this morning. Unfortunately, despite his best efforts, as you know, in a time of crisis like this with the health system and economically, he wasn't able to join us this morning. But we do hope that he will join us in a subsequent uh, webinar. And just to say that we were particularly uh, excited to welcome him as the Irish Health Service collaborates with the Sudanese Ministry of Health uh, around improving the quality of care in paediatric hospitals through the SAFE programme. And for years, just living in Ireland, we, we, benefit, um, we benefit enormously from the skilled Sudanese doctors um, and health workers based here in Ireland. So we look forward to, to having him on at a later date. Um, however, we have some wonderful panelists uh, who are here with us today. Many of you will, be, will know very well uh, Greg Gonzalez. Um, he's an epidemiologist and global health advocate and assistant professor in Yale University, um, but very much known to me and many others as a, a longtime AIDS activist, uh, starting his career with, uh, you know, very much involved in ACT UP in the US and going on then to co-found the Treatment Access Group in South Africa and, and also co-found ITPC, the International Treatment Preparedness Coalition. So really excited to have you, Greg, and thank you for getting up early for us. Um, also delighted to welcome uh, Michael Higgins, welcoming you home to Ireland. Michael, presuming you're sitting in New York today, uh, you're with the Pathfinders program. You're the lead on inequality and inc exclusion at New York uh, University Center on International Cooperation. And we know that in a former life, you've also been a human rights advisor to the Irish permanent mission to the UN. So thank you for, for being here. Uh, very excited also to welcome um, Ataya Waris. She's a professor and a writer. She's based in Kenya. She has specific expertise in financing development from diverse perspectives, and she's a longtime advocate for human rights. And she's with the University of Nairobi uh, in Kenya. And then last but absolutely not least, we are delighted to welcome um, Odette Nira Milimo. I hope I say that right. Bienvenue on your lawn. And uh, she is a Rwandan physician and senator, and she's also a member of the African European Parliamentary Initiative, AEP, AEPI, who are co-hosting this with us today, and she has served as a, as a Minister for State for Social Affairs, also in a former life. So welcome to all of you. Thank you for taking, uh, taking the time. Very excited to be hosting this webinar, co-hosting this webinar on human rights and competing priorities in the global response to COVID. So I thought we could start with you, Greg, um, if we can. Um, there's so many different topics you could speak to, but we could ask you maybe you have particular um, ex experience of testing undiagnosed populations from your work on HIV. And now decades later, we have a different virus. What are the key principles that we should be bringing to testing and to human rights safeguards when it comes to COVID-19? So I, I think no matter where you are, um, well, actually, I'll, I'll start with in the U.S. We, we, we test very few people and we, we apparently don't have the capacity to test everyone in the country. So it's a question of where are you going to find 
uh, those who are most at risk of, of, of SARS-CoV-2 uh, infection. Um, what's been interesting is uh, all diseases are not alike. They all have their, their uh, disparities that they bring along with them. Um, in the United States, it's pretty clear that uh, people mo most at risk are people in high proximity, uh, low work from home locations. So they have a tendency to be um, in those professions which they don't have the luxury of distancing. Uh, uh, and when they do have to go to work, they're, they're cheek by jowl with other people. So we're thinking of uh, professions where we've seen outbreaks in the US, meatpacking plants, um, nursing home workers, not only the, 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 the people who live there, uh, 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 prisons, but also grocery stores and things like that. So we're trying to figure out where people are is, is uh, an important piece uh, of the testing puzzle. The other thing, it's interesting to know that in the state where I sit in Connecticut, 60% of the, the, the deaths are in uh, nursing homes and the other in communities of color, African-American, Latino communities around, around the state. And so we need to make sure that there's access to testing, but also it's done equitably. Um, and this, you know, um, these sort of uh, ideas mean even more in places where testing reagents and testing kits are even in scarcer supply. Yeah, Greg, thank you for that. We really, really appreciate the experience that you have on testing, given that, you know, that it's the kind of everybody is talking about how to test, who to test, how much to test. Um, what about, you know, some of the work, I mean, you've worked in many parts of the world, but your work on Africa, you've worked on HIV, you've worked on TB, you've worked on, on silicosis, you've worked on cholera. How do you see COVID-19 um, among the hierarchy of needs, particularly in life in low middle income countries based on your previous experiences? Um, you know, after going through the HIV epidemic, I thought like, you know, I'd only see one catastrophic pandemic in my lifetime, mm. um, new disease, not leave TB out of it. Um, but COVID-19 is, um, I don't, I think it's a world historical public health event. Um, I, I think we haven't seen anything like this since the 1918 influenza pandemic, um, which none of us are, are old enough to remember or, or to feel the effects of, um, you know, everything's going to be COVID-19 for the next three to four years. Um, what I worry about is the, you know, from my work around the world is that we're going to forget about the epidemics of TB, HIV, hepatitis C, malaria, um, other major killers of people around the world. And we're going to see excess deaths. What we're going to see is people dying of COVID-19 in, in, in the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands around the world, but we're also going to see people who otherwise should have been alive dying from the disease that we were so desperately trying to fight before all this broke out. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I mean, I think when you're thinking about um, human rights, I mean, we talk about human rights and we really are, you know, everybody is very aware now. I think unlike with when the AIDS epidemic was, was first coming out, people are very aware of the importance of human rights and a human rights approach. But nevertheless, it still can be difficult to be practical about that, especially in a time of emergency. So practically, you know, how can we integrate an effective human rights framework into COVID responses? And I would say that's both for like for high and for low middle income countries. Any advice? any suggestions, anything to share with us? So the way I think about it is that none of us are safe until all of us are safe, right? Um, and in my community, it's people who are homeless, people who are, use drugs, sex workers, people who don't have the luxury of sheltering in place, or people in, in, in our prisons and jails um, who are in these congregate settings, which basically throw them into the passive epidemics. And so um, human rights is even more important than ever, because if we think it's just about the people who are able to shelter in place and can weather the storm over the next few months, um, we've got another thing coming. And unless we can get rid of COVID everywhere, we're not gonna get rid of it anywhere. And it means the least among us are just as important as the most powerful people in our societies in terms of making sure they're cared for, making sure they have the ability to protect themselves from infection. And that's a basic human rights principle. Yeah, and then Greg, I mean, what would you say to us if you were, you know, if you were to say, look, these are the three things that no matter what else you do, as you think about COVID and you're trying to respond, these are the three things you must do or think about in terms of human rights to make sure we're on the right track. Well, one is to speak out. Um, we've seen a lot of leaders behaving badly across the world, um, from Boris Johnson in the UK to Donald Trump here in the United States. Um, you know, and I think 
speaking out on behalf of, of the most vulnerable is, is really important. It's very easy when you feel um, under siege yourself in your house, having left for, for days, um, that you forget about other people. The other thing is, is that it's about uh, having a global framework. You know, a lot of worlds shrink to your town, your state, your province, your, your country, and you get all caught up in that. Um, you know, this is a global health problem and we need to think about our neighbors, not just the people who live next door to me, but the Canadians to the north, the Mexicans to the south, but also everybody else around the world. So not losing our sort of internationalist focus is really important in times like this that make us hunker down and think only of the people nearest to us. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I think you're also speaking there to solidarity, which has come up quite a lot in almost in every webinar we've had. And, you know, you know, it, within that kind of frame of solidarity, you often talk about uh, agency. You talk, you talk about the topic of, of health agency and, um, you know, in health policy and, you know, particularly in your work with with health, uh, with with policymakers. You know, you talk about the, the lack of investigative journalism into, for instance, President Trump's COVID-19 policies. Uh, you talk about a lot of, you know, you talk about so many things, but, you know, talking about the agents, who are the critical agents in informing an effective rights-based COVID response across the world? So my a colleague, Amy Kaczynski uh, at Yale and I have written a bunch of pieces for the Boston Review, and I'll try to put them in the chat. Um, but we talk, we've been talking about how do you make this a bottom-up approach to, to fighting COVID. I mean, any of us who come to the AIDS epidemic realize that it's been communities that have been really at the forefront of the fight. And I think it's going to be the same thing here. Um, it's not going to be a top-down public health approach. Um, and I think um, giving people the ability to organize locally, to, to do contact tracing, or to do social support, um, infection control is going to be really important. I just think um, these top-down public health approaches didn't work for HIV they're not going to work for COVID-19. So I think trying to empower communities and local organizations on the ground is going to be really important because trust is so important right now. Nobody wants to get tested or contact traced if they don't believe they're going to be treated fairly. Just so similar from the AIDS uh, from the AIDS epidemic, you know, we could be talking about about HIV in the early days here. So, you know, and it's it's just so good to keep our learning as fresh as we can. Um, brilliant, Greg. I'm going to leave it there with you and move across if I can. And I'd love to circle back around to you and and just hear back from you again in a little while. Um, I'm going to come to uh, Rory, who um, normally I, I come to first. So, Rory, Professor Brewer from the he's a former head of the Department of Epidemiology and Public Health in the Royal College of Surgeons in Ireland. And he's our webinar anchor. And um, Rory, it'd be lovely if you could just give us a, a bit of an overview as well. So just just take us to to uh, the context of where are we at right now with a little bit on epidemiology and just some of your perspectives from this week. You're muted, Rory, still muted. Thank you, Nadine. So uh, while Alan is just pulling up uh, the slide there, um, it, uh, some of the themes that uh, Greg was just talking about uh, actually come through. In the interest of time, I'm not going to go in to ask Ellen to go into that link there, but I would recommend the Worldometer link. Um, I was looking at the, you, you can just leave it on the title side, Ellen, for the, for the second. So I was just looking at the countries um, uh, uh, this morning, and of the top 12 countries, um, eight of them, you could say, have leaders who are populist, um, in some cases quite dictatorial in, in style, even if they were um, elected uh, democratically. Um, and some of them have a, a massive egos um, bent on denying science. Um, quite a few, uh, some of the countries in, in West Europe don't fit into that category. But it's just something worth noting. So, and I do recommend people look at it also because it gives you the, uh, the testing performance and uh, many of the, the countries who have the wealth to be testing better are not testing, are, are testing very little at all. Really uh, low performers are Brazil, uh, India still, and, and Iran. But we go on to the next slide. This is one we showed last week because uh, it, it came out on the 1st of May, um, a, a modeling uh, from uh, Imperial College in, in London. And that modeling was particularly useful in showing us possible impacts on HIV, AIDS, TB, and, and malaria. But I was a bit skeptical, I think I expressed it at the time. If you look at the, the estimated deaths that they modeled, um, uh, 
and, and if you looked at it for, for, for Africa, that would be equivalent to 7.3 7 million deaths in Africa. Um, so if we go to the next slide, and this is the most useful slide uh, today now. Um, uh, this came out on the, on the 7th of May. The, um, it's, it's on the WHO Afro website. It didn't give us a lot of information, but you could see it was projecting a, a more credible uh, estimate for, for deaths um, in, in, in um, Africa, both Sub-Saharan Africa and North Africa. But what I put in there at the bottom is this paper that just came out um, this morning. It's um, been accepted in BMJ Global Health. And this is from WHO Af Afro uh, in, in Brazzaville. And I think it should, gives us some encouragement because it, it comes up with, I think, our more plausible estimates of the numbers of symptomatic cases, um, 37 million, 150,000 deaths, uh, hospitalizations. Yes, it's going to be hu hugely um, traumatic for African health systems. It, at least it gives us a scale of the problem. And it has tables there which bring down these estimates to individual country levels. And I think we're, Africa is, is going to be in a better position when it actually has a grasp of the, of the challenge uh, facing it over the next um, one to two years in, in particular. So I would recommend you to go and read that paper if, if Africa is your focus. Um, so we go on to the next slide. Uh, and I think if you look at some of the factors uh, that might explain why Africa in some ways may be less impacted on, um, at least in terms of the scale of the, the COVID epidemic. And, and as Greg was saying, and we talked about last week, it's more the indirect impacts that would be the biggest concern. But it has a younger population. Um, I, I, I've heard that something like a million people have left Addis Ababa to go back to the rural areas. It's um, the ex excess mortality may not be measured to the same degree, which is a concern. But also I think Africa may be able to draw on experience and, and uh, of Ebola and of other communicable diseases. Uh, and while a month ago, six weeks ago, I was predicting uh, um, a very bleak picture for Africa, um, I, it may not be as bleak. But as we looked at last week, and as Greg mentioned there, the impacts on HIV, TB, uh, malaria. So you have links for that. I put in a link now to a, a Lancet paper on mother and child health. Um, David Weeklim sent around one this morning from WHO on the impacts on mental health. And in a couple of weeks time, I think we're going to focus on some of these priority uh, diseases. In previous uh, webinars, we've talked about the importance of the resilience of, of health systems. And WHO Afro have come to the conclusion that, yes, we do need to do containment at the moment. Uh, the epidemic is somewhat delayed and we'll need to move into mitigation. But at least we have a blueprint for Africa. And that's the one thing that encourages me. So I think the next slide then. So I've just got three slides here, which I thought would frame today's uh, uh, talk. And, and um, uh, Ellen uh, put, it, put these up uh, for people to refer to during the webinar. So the, the response, which has been updated over the last week from the UN is firstly, a human humanitarian response. And, and it's, it's quite a broad brush one, but it's trying to get this macro level picture. Let's go and look at the second one. You can all read these on your slides. This fits very much with what we talked about in previous webinars, uh, an eight pillar public health response from WHO. And we've given you some links previously to uh, uh, guidelines from WHO to enable countries to respond. And then thirdly, I think it's this, the broader framework that we need for the socioeconomic uh, response. And this is the one that goes beyond health systems. So we're getting a blueprint. From, from the UN organizations who have performed remarkably well during this epidemic, far better than some of the wealthiest countries in, in the world. And I think now I'm beginning to see hope because uh, we can see a direction ahead. So I'll leave it at that, I think, and hand it back to you, Nadine. Thank you, Rory. It's, um, it's really, really useful to, to be seeing that and as well to be kind of seeing this week by week. This is the, uh, the ninth webinar that we've had. So the ninth Friday we've been sitting together and um, it's just really interesting to, to see how it's, uh, how it's moving. So thank you for that. 
Um, good. So I think I'll come. I can, Michael. I'll, I'll come to you. I'll come to yourself um, and kind of bring us just bring us a little bit back in terms of um, of the theme, which is around around rights. You know, human rights. So, I mean, from your work in collaboration with uh, with with countries, have you encountered positive examples where there has been, you know, a, pos a public health response to COVID that is really supportive of human rights? Have you anything you can share with us? I'm just checking my. I'm unmuted. You're unmuted. Yeah, okay. we can hear you very well. So, yeah. so just to explain briefly to some others, I, I'm part of a platform that kind of shares lessons and experiences between um, a kind of a cross regional collection of countries about addressing inequality and exclusion. But since the advent of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's also kind of become a vehicle to share experiences of lessons about responding um, to the pandemic. So, you know, there ha it has been very challenging overall in terms of the uh, rights response. Um, there's, you know, out of necessity in responding to an emergency, there's a kind of a certain amount of necessary restrictions, but then there's, of course, um, a tension. But in terms of very positive examples, I think uh, some that come to mind, for example, in Sierra Leone, which, of course, had to deal with the Ebola virus in 2015, um, kind of commuted, there's been a it's been kind of given into the charge of kind of community leaders, religious groups, female leaders, union, civil society, to kind of share good public information and, and um, hygienic practices. So in one sense, it's kind of allowed, it's kind of empowered um, community, the communities and the citizens to kind of, and, and given them kind of agency to be at the forefront of the public health response, which is very positive. There's also been, for example, um, although, Sierra Leone is resource strapped. It's ensuring that health workers have an increased salary, gives them life insurance guarantees um, to their families and ensures that there's kind of tuition for the children of health workers who are, are um, for example, lose their, lose their lives in response during this period. Um, South Korea, of course, has been kind of praised quite a lot for, you know, testing its testing, tracking and tracing system. But when we actually speak to the South Korean leaders, they very much put an emphasis on the citizen-led approach and the kind of foundations and transparency and kind of the, um, the citizens acting as kind of using their moral suasion and their networks to share good information. This is a lesson they, of course, learned as well from responding through MERS in 2015, which they didn't respond as well to, but they've responded much better um, to COVID. In Portugal, this is a very interesting example where they've given um, all foreigners who have applications um, to are now being treated in this period as permanent residents. So this means that they can get access to the health service, wealth, welfare benefits, um, bank accounts and other issues related to work and rental contracts. So that was a very kind of farsighted and pr progressive approach. Coming back to, I think, what um, Greg was saying in Mexico, there's a lot of very interesting bottom up initiatives, which kind of are, uh, which are kind of, which were already kind of based around the links between community development, health and the environment. And they've kind of been adapted for the COVID-19 era. era. Um, another positive example is in Ethiopia where, and this is the case in some other countries as well, like Indonesia, where you have existing social protection systems which have now been gener generously adapted to the COVID era. So for example, in Ethiopia, you'll now get their productive safety nets program is their big, one of the biggest uh, cash for work programs in Africa. It's people are now going to be given three months advance payment and their, um, their kind of working obligations or public works obligations are kind of being, are being, um, they don't have to exercise them. And then within Indonesia, there's already existing kind of positive, what they call village laws, which kind of give a lot of agency to kind of to uh, communities and villages to exercise control over, over resources. They've kind of been given additional resources and um, they're being set up to assist to provide information and income support and monitoring and a few other things. And then interestingly, actually to speak to what Greg said earlier, and especially the idea that no one is safe until all are safe in New Zealand, there was, uh, they were quite prescient and they were sure to make sure that particular vulnerable populations, for example, Maori and Pacific, Pacific Islander populations who had a history of being um, 
of having, say, poorer public health outcomes that were, a, you know, a particular group at risk, more resources at, a, at an earlier stage were uh, dedicated to that group. So in contrast to what you see, for example, in the UK and America, you have, you have in New Zealand, you don't have a situation where historically marginalized groups are showing greater uh, incidence of death than the regular population. So they're just some of the positive examples I, I wanted to share. Yeah, I'm really, really happy to hear. I'm sure all of us are really happy to hear those positive examples and, and also just from so many different countries and so many different parts of the world. I think it's really important that we hear those positive examples, um, particularly when we're talking about human rights and we can be inspired by, by things that are happening in different countries. Um, just to ask you, I mean, it's, it's always a, it's, 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 it's often come up, you know, public health, public health, human rights. I mean, is there a tension between the need to protect human health and life um, and also, you know, exercise human rights? Um, you know, what examples have you seen that you could share with us that could help understand that tension and also how to alleviate that tension? You know, I think in an emergency situation, there's going to be natural restrictions, but I think sometimes this framing around attentions between kind of freedom of expression and assembly and the imposition of lockdowns isn't all that helpful. Our, our Congress, where it's framed as terms of, in terms of trade-offs between the needs to deliver good public health outcomes and then the need somehow to sacrifice rights for that. We've actually found in our work that there's a lot of, some of the most uh, successful responses have kind of taking place in rights-friendly landscapes. So, and I think in terms of this question about that sometimes happens between health and human rights, I think a thing that's been not sufficiently discussed is the issue of, you know, the sense of consent and not coercion. Sometimes it becomes some kind of like a, a technocratic or technical uh, discussion about which, which, but of course every country is completely different and the, the social and cultural, you know, environment and landscape is completely different so you, you don't really a blanket approach isn't one to go i think um at the same time pe people have appreciated the role of government and states in protecting pe people so there's almost what's good positive perhaps is um trusted support has got up on the basis that people are seeing that uh perhaps government is is you know taking up the mantle of as a duty bearer um, but at the same time, I think as well, in terms of these tensions you talked about, in a lot of parts of the world, especially low and middle income countries, there's, you know, a need for people to pursue a daily wage. People earn their wage in a daily basis. There's also sometimes weaker state uh, institutions. So informal social networks are what people use to um, assist. And so when you have kind of a kind of a reactive response, say, with a kind of a blanket lockdown where there isn't, for example, even social protection systems are, you, you suddenly, you generate, um, you generate tensions that actually restricting the rights environment in terms of both, say, civil, political and the movement actually prevents the natural organic ability of the, pre, of the existing social threads and institutions to do their work to help assist the population. So sometimes, you'll have attention where even though it comes from it's from, it's well meant you're indirectly restricting um avenues which would actually be very helpful to producing good health outcomes i'm aware as well that some of those things for an end, uh, end to lockdowns it's very much a case of crocodile tears and they're more interested in in kind of really pursuing profit more than uh human concerns and there's also a danger from these people and discourses like that, that suddenly health workers and those voicing very legitimate concerns about how we need to address public health will suddenly be portrayed as being um, Jacobian or something like that. So one of the things I think that will be helpful in terms of overcoming these tensions and rights is, as even as Greg was saying, the more bottom up we can make it, the more we can ensure citizens' voices are involved even despite the challenging landscape and the more that governments and duty bearers can demonstrate that they're respecting and aware of the kind of social contract uh, that exists and the more we can have a whole of society approach the better it will be for the rights landscape. I hope yeah. that's 
so helpful. Yeah, no, very, very clear, Michael, really, really clear points. Um, maybe just the same question to you as I asked to Greg just before I moved. I mean, if you were to give us, you know, three things that practically we could be, you know, we should say, yes, if, we're, if we really want to make sure that we have a good human rights response, what are the three things that we must not forget? So I think number one that we, what we've seen from our countries is that trust is a very valuable and essential um, I don't want to say commodity, but it's also something that needs to be um, earned as well. So, um, but when it's, when it's in place, you can have a much more constructive whole of society approach. Restrictions can be imposed and they'll be seen as well-intentioned. Um, where we found where, there's, where there is a, a great degree of political polarization and distrust, kind of a collective response uh, is harder and getting good information out is is harder. I think something else I've seen is that interestingly there's a sense of uh, resilience is another kind of factor. So in Korea because they had the experience of MERS in 2015 which showed it showed them that where there was a poor information environment it led to kind of feelings of insecurity and people not reporting um, whereas when they were much more transparent and allowed communities and citizens to be at the fore and kind of and using you know communities moral suasion and the kind of effective ties of people and communities that actually led to people you know behaving better on getting better information and and and, and reacting better uh, the same is in sierra leone the what they've discovered from the ebola virus is you need to empower communities because they're in the position to know best they have the influence with uh, people to be able to offer advice and suggestions in a way that it will be taken up by um, the population. I think as well it's important no country is going to respond perfectly to this pandemic but what's a, a distinction afterwards is those who are going to have learned lessons and those who didn't. So for example because Korea was aware and was held kind of democratically accountable they had the opportunity to learn the lessons which they benefited from afterwards. But because after that, as, and as others have said, there's a health pandemic, but in, in, for example, Africa and also to a certain extent in Latin America, the economic crisis is hitting at the exact same time as the, the health pandemic. I think lastly, in terms of a really what's very important, I think is things like, for example, trade unions which we forget, but they're kind of really the largest democratic organizations in the world. And I think they'll play a crucial role. What we found from you know, our countries we work with is where there's a large scale involvement and membership of citizens in civic organizations, um, not just unions, but in religious groups and members of their community groups, that gives you this very solid social foundation, which allows citizens to very organically organize and access their Ex exercise their voice in this emergency atmosphere where you don't have where you have kind of weaker or debilitated kind of unions and civic organizations and less connections and interactions between citizens yeah. it's harder to um generate uh it's harder to get to for that kind of communication between citizens yeah. and government to happen yeah. Um, so that's, yeah. that's, I would say they're my, some of my key points. Sorry if I was... Good. No, that's wonderful. I think it's really, really important, those points. And I just think the themes are already coming up. I mean, you can hear these issues of trust, but particularly the issues of community voices and, and, and a bottom-up approach. And I see just in the chat there from Brida, you know, what we've learned from HIV and human rights, nothing about us without us. And I think that's, you know, the, making sure that we hear those vo the voices of people most affected uh, coming through. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to come over to Ataya, and I know Ataya, it's a little bit of a different, um, a different kind of angle on this, but really important. You know, how can can COVID-19 be a catalyst to some of the new social contracts, new health systems, and then you know within that paradigm, new ways for citizens to take ownership of services and institutions. Um. Hey Nadine, thank you very much for that. I, I've been listening very carefully and I see a lot of resonance in, in what both the previous speakers have said. I mean, I've already heard the word social contract a couple of times. So social contract is in a bit of a crisis right now. And I was in a conversation with a group of corporates um, 
directors and tax specialists just yesterday, and they were talking about a new social contract between a state, society, and corporation. So for anyone who understands social contracts, social contracts are only ever between human beings and people and the state. That is the traditional social contract space. The fact that people are now able to openly speak about very new ways of looking at it is both um, concerning and has a lot of uh, power-based negative influences, but it, at the same time, it could result in a, a renewal or a, a reflection or a revision of the status quo. And if I speak about it from the context of the, the African continent, which is where I'm based, many of the constitutions are extremely old and populations don't know anything about it. So the pandemic is really not going to make the difference to those populations because they didn't even know there was really this social contract in place. But for those who are in countries like, for example, Kenya, my own country, where the, the constitution is 2010, it's already in the living memory of the existing population that the state has got rights and responsibilities and has power as well, and that the population can now begin to action on those issues. And I think that in those spaces, there's a faster reaction, there's more engagement with actually activating the social contract, I would say, before we even talk about a new one. And in the countries where the constitutions are much older, conversations being had about what is the state's responsibility and why are they not doing what we think they should be doing. Um, we have a couple of policies, for example, there's one in Rwanda, we'll not go into it because of course we have a debt. But um, in Kenya, we have a similar one where we have a, a 10 family grouping policy. And one of the first things government did here is they said, when we're quarantining, you need to let government know if your neighbor arrived back and um, did not report in for quarantining. And I think that that is really quite important um, in many spaces, that there is this sort of community-based approaches. Now, it has the negative part of it, which is you're reporting on your neighbors. That also has negative connotations to it. And so surveillance issues within a social contract are also coming up. I'll stop there because it's, it's a much bigger conversation, of course. Yeah, no, really, you, really important points. And Atiyah, your video has gone and that might be okay. I think it was freezing a little bit, but um, but totally up to you if you're coming back on video. There you are. Okay. okay. Yeah, that's um, fine. Yeah. So you also talked, I mean, you're talking about, about the shift as well. Um, you know, what about, I mean, if with this transformation that, that's, that's likely to be taking place, I mean, how, who's going to pay for that? And, and how can these systems, you know, as they move to new systems, be, be made sustainable, you know? So th that's actually a very interesting question, because at the global level, all of our discussions around financing the health uh, systems crisis, because of course, when you're not coming in from health, you see it as a very uh, cut and dried uh, topic. When, when we're looking at it from tax, where we first looked at it from the perspective of what do you have in your budget and what do we need to shift that you're not spending anymore? That's always the first step. The second step was once you've shifted the budget that is not being used now, did you have an emergency budget? And I, I, I liked what Rory was saying because one of the few countries that have publicly available data on their emergency funds is actually New Zealand. So it's quite interesting that we're drawing the same conclusions, but from different spaces. The countries that are reacting better and faster in the epidemics are actually the same countries that had clear emergency funds with uh, money attached to it. So now what would be this sort of new direction we want to take after it? There's a lot of discussions about financial transactions and whether we should renew those. There are conversations around taxes on climate for protecting the climate or carbon taxes, taxes on the environment. But the bigger problem that will emerge when we do, when we take that sort of a direction in my understanding is that climate gone down a bit. Some of the statistics are showing that things are not as bad as they were, but from an African perspective, it's only 5% of global carbon emissions that were coming from our part of the world. So carbon will not really be a major money earner for the developing world, as much as it will be for the developed world, as it were. But the last one that's been popping up, and the IMF are actually seeming to be discussing it in, in a more serious way, is actually a solidarity tax. And of course, earlier speakers have talked about solidarity. So, you know, now there's also a solidarity tax as well. And for the solidarity tax, it's, it's quite interesting because the idea is to put in place a tax temporarily 
for the duration of the pandemic and then drop it back off the table once we've uh, come through it on the other side. Now that makes a lot of sense because when they used to be fired um, in developed countries, there's a famous fire of Lisbon, for example. Uh, when there was a fire, there was a tax to rebuild the city. And when the city was rebuilt, they removed the tax. So there are a lot of those possibilities that are being debated right now, but there aren't any clear decisions yet on the way forward. Back to you, Nadine. Oh, thank you, Atiyah. Um, maybe just to ask you, I mean, your work has all been around, um, we're talking about human rights and your, your work has all been around economic justice. Um, so just, you know, with, with your work on economic justice, how effective is a rights-based approach when you come with the hat that you're wearing? <laughs> it's um, the positive for me in the mid middle of a pandemic is that it perfectly shows how finance must be used to raise living standards. It's like almost a given. The moment countries reacted on the pandemic, they immediately needed money. And a lot of debates that I've been pushing for the past 15 years has been that rights require resources. So, hey, here is a right. It's the right to health. There's emergencies attached to it. It's crucial for survival. So there's right to life attached to it as well. And it's money that is going to help us get through the process. Um, I know it's not always swallowed well, but really for me, this is a, a fantastic opportunity to prove to countries. So tax expenditure and tax revenue need to both be connected through human rights as an expenditure and a revenue policy. And what I've been pushing for is to get countries to look at their budgets through the lens of human rights to see how they're spending it and then achieving those human rights as a result. So yeah, back to you, Nadine. Atiya, so much uh, wonderful food for thought and thank you for just putting those things together into, uh, into our minds as well, uh, practically as well as, as theoretically. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll, I'll leave you there, Atiya, and just go over to Odette and then come back around to you again if I can. Um, so, Dr. Odette, um, thank you for joining us from, uh, from Rwanda and we know that you have been very open about how your, your own early life has been, you know, very badly affected by the conflict in Rwanda and yet you overcame prejudice and violence. You became a doctor, a minister for social affairs and a regional uh, politician. And we all know the phrase very well now, leave no one behind, you know, in the context of the SDGs. So who do you fear could be left behind in Rwanda and in Africa more generally because of COVID? Thank you very much, Nadine, for inviting me to this panel. Uh, on that question, for working in the informal sector. It is very hard for them to survive this pandemic, but at least in Rwanda, I can a fund uh, to come help all those people uh, who work informally and also uh, the small and medium enterprises, uh, though all those will have a loan uh, with uh, a very little rate of interest and which can be reimbursed in a very long period. And uh, there's even a period uh, where uh, the government said for three or five years, no payment because we still don't know how long this pandemic will last. So uh, I can say those who are we're just not hearing you perfectly, just at the end there. It might be an idea as much as a shame if you could just to turn your video off. We might be able to hear you while you're speaking just a little bit better. And thanks for that. That's good, Odette, we can hear you. Okay, you can hear me now? All right. So I was talking of uh, all the people and especially the young people. Those people
because uh, what I can tell you is that in Rwanda, we have no new infections from yesterday. And now they closed the borders, uh, which stopped infections coming in. So uh, we think that uh, maybe now because the uh, confinement is slowly uh, being released, now we can't talk of lockdown anymore. Uh, people can go to work uh, within one province and uh, it is very things are a bit better <laughs> thank you dr oded we're hearing some things very clearly and then we're losing you but we are catching some some key points so um, I'd love just to try and ask you another question, um, if I can. Rwanda, I mean, all of us are, are so aware um, in global health of Rwanda's achievements in terms of, um, you know, the health, the, the success you've had with, with healthcare. Um, can you say a little bit around um, how, you know, how has that success in, in healthcare before COVID translated into, into, health, uh, into health now around COVID and beyond to pick up on some of the issues that, that Greg and, and Rory were speaking to? Uh, I can say that in Rwanda, the health system is very well organized uh, from uh, the top there are neighbors on what to do when there is a problem which has facilitated also uh, the communication from the government from the ministry of health and uh, that helped very much in tracing also because the community is very, very organized. Mm -hmm. And uh, today, uh, we can say that what facilitated also is that from the beginning, the government has uh, really uh, enforced uh, that while in, our, in some of our neighboring countries, uh, you, we see, we still see uh, the I say the, the, the fail of uh, lock, lockdown, even when the government talk of lockdown, but in Rwanda it is much easier because of the systems on, and how they've been organized. Mm. Yeah. 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 Do you hear me better now? Yes, on and off. We're really able, we are able to catch your, your key points. Um, so thank you for that. We, we, absolutely, we absolutely heard that. Um, I think what I will do, if, if that's okay, is just invite the, um, the panelists just to, to come back on with your video. And maybe I'll just come back around to you and ask for any responses. I mean, maybe Greg, coming back to you, um, just to ask for any responses to what you've heard, um, you know, just, just to, 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 to give us more food for thought and kind of keep us on the right track. Um, one thing I didn't hear talked about was um, hoarding by Europe and, and, and the United States and other big countries of key medical supplies, tests, PPE. Um, I, I think, I mean, I'll just talk about my own government. I don't think my own government cares about um, equitable access around the world to the commodities we need to keep people safe. To, to, we haven't even talked about vaccines or or treatments and how we're going to ensure equitable access to it, um, but we can already see that um, some countries are, or it's all for me, it's all for our people, and I think we have to sort of again think more in terms of solidarity and equity and and access, like we did with HIV. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, Greg. Um, Ataya, how about you? Would you give us a give us a give us a response there for just in terms of um, you know what what are you thinking on that? So um, a little bit about what Odette was saying, and again now, um, what has just come up. So 
we so at the University of Nairobi we have a we have a process in place where we are trying to support research uh, on this particular area and one of the things we found out very quickly for example was that a lot of the ventilator uh, tenders that had been given out to companies uh, across the world and I'm not going to name any names were actually cancelled because countries in the global north um, actually put in higher prices to receive the ventilators that were already being made. So our ongoing um, health uh, structuring was actually destroyed while, and that, that talks a little bit about what Rory was saying, I think about, you know, there's the existing health system that was ongoing being built up, and then you have this new set of health uh, healthcare needs coming up. And so our existing systems already been debilitated by that. Um, we've also had additional problems with other kinds of equipment that are being rerouted back to other countries or stopped at borders and returned because we can't get them. Um, I'd like to think that the positive out of that is that we will learn to be more self-reliant. And one of the effects has been, for example, that we now have um, mask manufacturing companies already set up within the country. We're retooling manufacturing um, for the region. And uh, the second thing is in partnership with other universities globally, we actually have our own ventilator being uh, developed. It, it was released uh, two days ago and we have another ventilator popping up. So we're getting to be a bit more self-reliant as a result of it, but the pressure on the system, unfortunately, because of lack of solidarity, has just happened the way it has. Now, the unfortunate thing is countries look inward in terms of crisis first, which is exactly what has happened. So can we really blame countries at a certain point? I think not, but then after a certain point, I think we need to move towards being very realistic and very human thinking about it. The only other thing I'd like to point out is we rolled out a series of um, suggestions to the Kenya government, and they've actually implemented some of them, which is fantastic for us. I think that the traditional stakeholders continued to be ignored initially, but with the lockdown, you suddenly couldn't access consultants from abroad, which was fantastic local consultants who'd been left out of the system. And so what we have in place now is I have 80 researchers at the University of Nairobi, all of whom are working on different elements of COVID, whether it's economic or masks and innovation, or it's the vaccine trials. And I think that, that we've managed to actually open a corridor to our own government that didn't exist before because we blocked out international consultants. I mean, it's, it's the flip. The flip is helping us as well. Um, but the other thing we noticed is some of the things that government started to roll out were not very good. So, for, for example, in quarantine, we rolled out the quarantine, but um, you had to pay for it yourself. And if you were poor, like who travels? We, we assume that it's middle and upper class traveling. But in, in Africa, it's also very small business people traveling to go and secure business deals and then come back. And students coming back as well. And so we we pitched it at a level where the people in quarantine couldn't even afford to pay for it and then were stuck in quarantine for an extra week sometimes while they were scrambling to get money to then come out of quarantine. So there are these other elements of the system also starting to pop up. Back to you, Nadine. Thank you, Acheha. Thank you so much. Um, I wonder as well, I know I see there's a question in there, just um, we haven't talked specifically about, um, you know, the challenges for, for refugees and IDPs um, and migrants in, in the response to COVID. Michael, I wonder if you have anything from your experience there that you could share with us on that. You're muted at the moment, Michael. So aside from that very positive example in Portugal, there, there is some kind of worrying signs of, you know, increased scapegoating and, and discriminatory attitudes towards vulnerable groups. Um, people will use this crisis as an excuse to, you know, drive their own particular agendas. For example, you've seen a lot of, uh, a lot of anti-Asian um, discrimination in lots of countries in the global North, I know in particular, for, for example, you've, all, you've also see for, for you've, you've got these very ironic things where suddenly because of the, the climate of, of, of uncertainty and emergency, groups are kind of accusing others of being kind of vectors of it, and especially those who, um, who have, you know, are historically marginalized, are less political capital, they sometimes don't have 
opportunities to to push back. So I think there is a, a worrying trend in terms of whether through religious, ethnic or other groups that there's a rise in discriminatory attitudes, which is worrying. This is, of course, and Greg will know much better in terms of there was how to how to overcoming stigma in terms of HIV and AIDS was a, you know, a very, not fully won, but a lot, you know, a long fought battle. And there's a worrying signs that always happens in situations where there's a new thing, where old prejudices will be kind of reanimated and placed on the new. We've even got seen discriminatory attitudes towards health workers who, while they're being lauded on one level, are also being seen as a potential vector of transmission into communities. So yeah. um, I'm sorry on this front, I'm, I'm kind of less, yeah, no, it was uh, really, less yeah, positive was, stories. Well, I think it's important to, to see the balance of that. And I think, you know, that the, the story of, of stigma, um, you know, we're still we're still we're still fighting the, the, the stigma with, with HIV as we are with many other things. And it's now it's about people looking for something and someone to blame. Um, and that's kind of what we're seeing now um, with with COVID. Um, Odette, I might come back to you and see if your connection is good. I see in the in the chat you have said there was a question about um, about testing in Rwanda. And you've said that testing was done mostly for people who are at risk for health workers and for all those who've been in contact directly and indirectly with people who had tested positively and as yet no deaths have been registered. Um, Odette, I wonder if you have any any last word, you know, just from your experience, from Rwanda's experience to share with, with all of us really about, um, you know, one or two things that we should be thinking about as we move forward. Uh, what I can say is that maybe in the future, or the countries, be it developed countries or people in Africa and in countries uh, which are in development, uh, they could uh, prepare uh, for preventing any kind of epidemic that might uh, just arrive because it, it, it is very clear uh, that people were not really prepared. And uh, I think uh, what uh, we've observed uh, could be a good lesson. And also, I think uh, looking at what uh, people who are now working from their homes are saying, I think it will no longer be necessary to be working in offices. Sometimes we, we see that people have big offices which are not really needed. Mm -hmm. Why don't we work in our homes and at the same time take care of our children, our families, instead of always moving from uh, home to the office or even to other regions. And there are so many things like even working on Skype or Zoom or uh, uh, virtually, instead of always using paper. And something else that uh, also happened in Rwanda is that uh, today we are like almost cashless. Uh, no longer people go to the bank uh, to get uh, notes. And it has taken a while that people accept to use mobile money, to use just bank transfers. And uh, it, it has taken uh, a lot of energy uh, to explain that. And I think this are uh, very good experience. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Dr. Odette. Thank you for bringing the, the personal so closely together with the professional, which I think all of us in every country around the world are experiencing um, are experiencing at the same time. All of the things that are being affected, staying at home, working in our in our homes, being closer to our families, um, all of those things are, are, are certainly an experience for, for all of us. Um, Rory, I will just ask you for a final word and then we're going to uh, try and keep to time. So just a very brief word uh, reflection from you, please. Um, thank you, Nadine. <clears throat> Another excellent uh, we uh, webinar. I see there were over 100 participants there. I have one suggestion, and it was actually sparked by uh, Michael's analysis and also a tea uh, around the importance of community voice, whole of society, trust, the social contract. 
Um, I've been trying to get a piece into the Irish Times for the last couple of weeks, proposing that to build community consensus, there's a model we have used in Ireland called the Citizens' Assembly. Uh, and I think it's something we might need to consider because uh, following on Johan Giesecke's uh, interview this morning, um, I think we're going to find a breakdown of consensus happening in Ireland and in other places. And I think you're, you're balancing protecting the public health, protecting the elderly, protecting our health workers against restarting the economy, personal freedoms. And I think for that kind of discussion, you, you need to have, you can't just rely on say government doing a top down. Anybody wants to know about it who's not familiar, so have a look at Citizens Assembly on Wikipedia. Uh, it's something which has uh, actually, uh, it, it, it so impressed us in Ireland. We were so surprised at how effective it was at bringing cohesion where there was the potential for, for conflict. Mm, thank you, Rory. Wonderful. We will go and um, have a look at that. And just want to, to thank deep, you know, sincerely thank each of the speakers for the incredible perspectives, for the places you've brought us to around the world and for the things that you have uh, helped us to really think through that we would never have uh, been thinking about. So thank you so much to each and every one of you. Um, I want to just say a special thank you to, uh, to Simon Murta, who worked behind the scenes to help us uh, make sure this webinar was, was, was as good as it is. So thank you to, to Simon and to AEPI, our co-hosts. And Hala, just to back to you. Yeah, we're, so thank you uh, to all the speakers for those really great insights. And because we are running over time, so I would say that next week it will be about protecting health workers in uh, during COVID-19 pandemic. So which will be also another interesting webinar. And uh, if this recording will be also available in our YouTube channel and also on our website and newsletters. And uh, those are the most important things. And uh, yeah, thank you everyone. See you next week and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you everybody. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.